Hi guys and welcome to this week's episode of the In The Hub podcast, brought to you by Playbox Technology UK. This week we're speaking to Alexander and Andre from Medialux, the media software development company that specialises in delivering video technology solutions to the broadcasting market. Hope you enjoy. Well, there we go. So welcome to the podcast guys, how are you both doing today? Good, thank you very much for having us. No, of course. It was great to get you guys on. Um, so, obviously, just before we start with the main kind of questions that we've got for you here, just for a little bit of background, how did you both start out in the in the broadcasting industry? Alex, do you want to start? Well, I guess it's your turn because my story is not well really based on the broadcasting at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I guess it's kind of uh, similar for me as well. So. Um, we didn't ever start in the broadcast industry. We were sort of um, led into the industry by our customers. So we started a software company doing uh, direct show filters. And that meant doing something with uh, video. And we had no idea where that was going or where those technologies were used. So we just did it. And eventually the, the customers sort of um, showed us the way to where those products are used, and that was uh, primarily the broadcast industry at first. Uh, so it was very much a case that you guys kind of fell into it. You weren't expecting it. Um, and I, I noticed there you, you you obviously mentioned that you primarily were, were focused on different industries than broadcasting. So what other industries are you guys still involved with? So those are... Um, um, there's we do we do a lot with customers in in the broadcast industry, but and and broadcast is split into sort of different areas. For instance, if uh, if a customer of ours is building a uh, vision mixing solution, is that the broadcasting industry, or or is that something you know adjacent? Because um, some some solutions are used in um, visual radio. And that is uh, sort of not exactly broadcasting in the common sense. Yeah, yeah. Right? And then other other industries that we've um, um, we went into um, with the SDK product was um, medical surveillance, um, media servers. That's entertainment, um, gaming, and you know visual inspection, industrial imaging. Alex, did I did I miss any any of the SDK applications here? Basically, they, they are all of them. Yeah. So it's it's quite a, a wide range then of, of industries and applications. So one day you could be dealing with with obviously a medical provider, the next day it's a, a multinational broadcaster. Um, sounds quite exciting for you guys. Yeah, so it's it's any anywhere where video is used professionally. No, sounds great, guys. And and for anyone who doesn't actually know about the company, uh, Media Looks as a company. Uh, you know, tell me a little bit about the company. What main products and services do you guys provide, as, as well as the SDK? Uh, well, it's kind of a Lego constructor for video develop for, for developers who build uh, video applications. So it's just a, a set of blocks that you can combine to build some some castle or a building or a house, whatever you can imagine. You can build with the bricks <laughs> provided by MediaWorks. That's a metaphor for uh, who is the gay that we provide to the customers. Yeah, I love that metaphor you guys provide in that, those building blocks for people to create something re really, you know, good. Um, and I, I know it's much of the kind of ethos and, and the value behind your company and your products is about saving time for developers. Um, you know, developers' time is obviously so worth, you know, worth so much uh, in this day and age. So in, in the kind of fast-paced world of, of, of broadcasting itself, how important and valuable is saving time to your customers? It's always a trade-off between the quality and the time and for the development. And the time to market is uh, really important for the customers uh, to bring the products to the market and start to gather in some way, uh, value and revenue uh, for, for, for the company they rule. And uh, we actually try our best to, to combine both uh, approaches. We save for the uh, time for the customers and we provide them with a quality solution. Yeah, so I, I, it, 
it just dawned on me just how obviously if you can help out developers in any way by providing one of those building blocks so they then don't have to spend you know weeks or months working on that themselves uh, especially in this industry it just saves so much time and just helps the product get to market faster doesn't it yeah that's this, this is exactly the the value proposition that we have with uh with the video sdk it's just it's it's specifically faster time to market of the product and also another another way um, our customers explaining it is that um, it allows them to focus on uh, the issues of their business, on the things that matter to their customers, which is either the workflow, the specific tiny features they need, or the user interface, or customer support, and they don't spend this uh, enormous development effort on building the the bricks the 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 encoders the decoders the the pipeline the the graphics the vision mixing the effects everything that that we handle with within the video sdk yeah no and no, we can speak from experience from from playbox side as well just how much that kind of helps our guys uh in the uh, in the development phase i'm i'm also kind of curious about what you guys think about open source technologies so obviously you guys being really technology kind of minded um uh, to the outside world uh, the people who, who might not know much about the topic uh, could you kind of explain the benefits and drawbacks of making a technology open source well if uh, something is free it doesn't mean that you know how to use it <laughs> <laughs> we really uh, use uh, under the hood of the video is the case some of the open source technologies like FFM tech and uh, we are pretty fine with uh, the experience with it and uh, actually we just uh, simplify the approach to use the same technologies uh, for outside for, for non-video developers so anyone uh, from uh, from any uh, with any background uh, can start uh, building video based uh, software using our SDK without any uh, any basic understanding of what video is and how to pro process it. So the uh, well reducing the threshold into the industry is the one of the benefits, uh, the side effect of uh, the time to market uh, already of our SDK. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's you guys providing the whole package basically, and. Uh, you're hard pressed nowadays to find something that doesn't have open source technology in, in inside it, isn't it? And yeah, I just noticed that's becoming a lot more popular as of late. Um, and just moving on to Media Looks as a company, and uh, fingers crossed, we're coming out of COVID. We're coming out the side of COVID nineteen. Will you guys be making an appearance at in person trade shows uh, or events this year, or, or will you guys be holding back? There's uh, there's two sides to it. There's um sort of an emotional side and the, the practical side. Um, uh, and like practical or social side to it. So I'd say that from from um, the emotional perspective is uh, like the, this this annual trip to IBC that we used to do. We do it we do it in a nice way um, because we we basically um, uh, for the last um, three years we've been renting the same house outside of Amsterdam which sits on a lake it has a piano in the house yeah <laughs> Alex place <That> sounds great <laughs> and it has a boat yeah so it has it has a motorboat and with the motorboat you can go out to lakes and you can travel to other lakes through um, sort of canals under the bridges it's it's like a super super nice team building, and and the whole the whole thing is really nice. It's it's like a, I don't know, I can't imagine. It's it's a really nice house, but they sold it, so we we're not going there anymore. And that happened. They they did it right before COVID, and um, we rented another house, and then we moved the rental to another year, and then we moved it to the third time. And the way we do it is we we um, we rent a huge bus. The whole team gets in there, and we take this two two day drive from from our city to um, Amsterdam, and then we go back. And it's and it's this um, this sort of happening, this experience that we miss in 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 the show. On the other hand, um, um, the uh, 
the financial results and the sales result that we've shown through the past two years without ABC has has been really good. So we we are we are quite happy with uh, with our growth, and that sort of pumps the question: was was that um, um, was IBC an important factor in 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 lead generation, or um, was it these two years just the, tr- the 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 fact that people's approach to uh, buying has transformed because there were no shows, so this factor kind of disappeared from the from the equation. So we don't know that, and uh, whether or not we're going um, this year or um, the the uh, the nearest twelve months is um, I'm likely to say no um, for the simple practical reasons of the the fact that there's still a lot of risks involved in whether the trip is going to happen. So getting a visa um, for the European Union has become more difficult. Any any flight that you're having can potentially be canceled in if you're planning it for three months from now. If you're planning for the next week, you, you sort of have a feeling what's going on. Maybe it's going to be okay. But if it's three months from now, you don't know how the situation will develop. They will say, okay, there's a new requirement with the vaccine or with something else with the test, or they're just going to plain cancel the whole thing. And the same applies to any show. Any show that is planned for December, there's no 100% guarantee it's going to happen. So that's kind of our framework. And I know for a fact so many companies are in that same predicament of, like you said, uh, analyzing the financial figures from the year and, and thinking, you know, it, are these trade shows going to be worth it for us this year? And and is the risk worth it? Um, which is a major part. But it, it, it really sounds like you guys, obviously, it wasn't just the trade shows for you, wasn't it? It, it was that whole team building experience as well, which is a, a crucial part of kind of company culture as well. Um, uh, it was always both. So yeah. it was both the, the team building experience and uh, the the communication with customers experience. And um, I would say that um, uh, all the all the relationships we have with customers are um, a lot of them are quite personal, and um, they they were all built, you know, in tiny bits that consists of meeting them annually at specific shows. And um, uh, that's how those relationships are built. So I think that I think it uh, that those the two of those sides would play a role in in going back to trade shows. But um, it's the risks that are holding us back, and I think many companies. So as, as soon as we go back to normal and everything is predictable, then hopefully. We're going to we're going back to this really nice and useful practice. I do miss the predictability of of pre COVID life sometimes. Um, and and guys, support in itself, the concept of support is a topic that I, I also kind of wanted to touch on with you guys. That's something that you guys really value um, and and champion. How important do you guys think it is to kind of also let your customers help themselves in some respects? So. Um, with different types of software and solutions, I see a lot of companies now are really emphasizing this, this giving the customers the knowledge. So knowledge bases, uh, frequently asked questions, manuals, things like that, you know, bringing that help to the customers, allowing them to, to find it themselves. Uh, do you think the kind of days of 24 seven frontline support are over? Do, do you think customers will always need that level of, of, of support? Um, or do you think they can help themselves nowadays? Well, I don't think that uh, the 24-7 support is necessary in the development world because, well, if uh, something is in the development process, then there is not a mission critical, I I suppose. (laughs) Uh, For what I do believe uh, is that the Jira-based support is uh, over (laughs) because, well, you don't you really don't need to wait for the tier one, tier two, tier three engineer uh, to join the conversation to understand the problem. It's uh, really frustrating for the customers. And if you can get the answer for your questions, uh, 
uh, from the just a single person that knows your project, that knows you personally, and uh, knows how to uh, cooperate with you uh, properly and effectively, uh, then it uh, benefits for the both sides. Uh, the customer is happy, the engineer is happy, uh, and the team is happy. <laughs> Um, as for the help centers and documentation, we basically covered the really basic scenarios of uh, the SDK usage, <laughs> but uh, here and there, there are tiny tricks uh, that customers need some time, and uh, the best approach for them, on my mind, uh, is to ask the question for uh, to the support team, and we, we, we are more than happy to uh, to describe the best possible approach to reach the goals. Because sometimes uh, uh, the customers are really uh, get into the details too deeply. <laughs> and the solution yeah, is yeah. really on the, uh, on the surface. And you don't need to figure out the bits and bytes of each and every frame, whereas there is a possible solution with the simplest uh, approach. That's that's uh, the the fact that our support team is alive. I mean, uh, uh, is ready to cooperate uh, in person with uh, customers is one of the uh, decision making uh, factors for the customers to work with us. Yeah, that's true. And Alex, um, uh, there's also another side to support, which um, if you look at it from uh, the side of other products like video transport or direct uh, Well, if there is a, a scenario where the mission critical factors are important, like you are in production, then the 24-7 support is required. And uh, uh, we can discuss uh, this uh, type of support with uh, the with the customers if it is necessary for them. But basically, uh, well, <laughs> uh, if the product is really good, so you don't need the 24 7 support. And we try our best to, to build the very reliable solutions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I I just know as a customer myself, I'm I'm always keen on finding the information myself, finding answers myself. Kind of gives me this this sense of gratification if I can fix it myself. Um, but yeah, I completely agree with you guys. It's important to have that next level of support uh, for customers who need it, and of course, mission critical customers, which I imagine makes up a, a fair amount of your customer base. Um, will, will be these mission critical broadcasters and and medical organisations and things like that. Um, and then, guys, this one is a question that we ask at the end of every podcast, um, and I'd like to get both of your opinions on this. And it's just, if you could summarize it in one word and one word only, what do you envision for the future of the broadcasting industry? Streaming. Streaming. What about you, Andre? Well, my first, I agree with Alex totally, but uh, my first uh, answer was narrow casting. Okay. Which means basically the fact that um, uh, so broadcasting approach is, uh, you know, you have 50 options for uh, 100 million people, like 50 options, maybe 100 options. And with, with where the industry is heading today, you have a zillion options to the same audience. So everybody is free to watch whatever they want. And the, 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 peak, the peak audience, the peak numbers for a show would would never reach the, the, the whole audience. So this, the audience is being split into specific groups of interest and everybody's looking or watching exactly what they want. Yeah, no, I, I definitely think that's the way forward. Um, even just targeted advertising as well, I think is gonna be major. It's gonna be huge um, for, for broadcasters and streaming platforms um, in the future. So I completely agree with you guys on that one, especially streaming um it's it's huge at the moment isn't it absolutely massive um so obviously guys thanks for joining me today and, and talking me through some of those questions are there any exciting po uh, plans in the pipeline for you guys that you can talk to us about today or, or is it all under wraps at the moment um sure well we, we can we can mention a few things so um still heavily involved with a rel uh, relatively new product which is um video transport so it's a um 
So this is the, the video SDK is a, is a product that targets developers and other products that we're going to be talking about, they target video engineers. So if you're a video, video engineer who is um, engaged into producing things remotely or virtually, which is a very popular subject these days, then you need some kind of solution to deliver uh, raw feeds from remote locations to your um, vision mix or studio or wh wherever the place is where you handle the, the, the streams and do their production or do their recording. So video, video transport is, is, is one of such solutions and it is um, um, pretty interesting and flexible. So it gives you scenarios like point-to-point -point video stream delivery or um, a synchronized uh, delivery from multiple cameras uh, to do a remote multi-camera production or such scenarios as um, when you are sending someone a link and he opens that link in, in a browser or, or an iPad and is a guest in your uh, show. Or um, a, a nice example actually of things that, that product a product like this can do is the, the recently um, produced um, show with Opera and uh, Obama where they had this green screen farsight chat and they were in different locations, but because of the green screen technologies, they sort of made it look like it was in one room. So this is, this is production wise, this is one of the trends and where we're responding to this trend with, with this video transport product. Another uh, application is, uh, maybe Alex should talk about them as uh, direct take, which is a brand new um, uh, multi-camera, multi-channel multi video recording solution, which is pretty neat, I think. And another one is uh, direct convert. Alex, can you, can you speak about those? Uh, yeah, the <clears throat> direct take is, uh, can be described in like, uh, get a video from any kind of source, from cameras, from network streams, and capture it to any video files or stream it uh, to any protocols <laughs> you need. And uh, this direct convert, uh, the idea is to replace the hardware in the uh, to SDI and SDI to NDI converters with the software that does actually the same. On a single machine, you can convert up to 16 uh, signals from SRT feeds, from SDI feeds, from NDI feeds to SDI or NDI. And this, well, uh, simplifies and work for for the customers so they don't need to manage a lot of hardware uh, devices uh, to keep them with, uh, in, in, in case <laughs> uh, from show to show just can install the software and do the work yeah. the job. no it, it sounds like it's really exciting times for you guys at the moment it's great to hear that you're obviously uh taking note of and responding to to customers needs and wants and a, a lot of the time now, especially with us as well, it's it's customers are just wanted to streamline their workflows um, and get as much as they possibly can in as little a package as possible, um, which we, we can't blame them for. Um, and how can people get in touch with Media Looks directly if they want to get in touch or inquire about anything? Well, the starting point is our website, medialooks.com. And uh, all around the website, there's there's places where you have contacts and you can send a message or or just send anything to um, sales at medialogs.com yep so what we'll do guys we'll uh, link to your website in the podcast description so anyone listening on on spotify apple music any anywhere like that uh, you guys can find the link to the website there so once again thank you very much guys for taking the time out today to, to come and talk to me about media looks and, and some of the projects that you've got going on uh, really do appreciate it thank you neil Thank, Thank you, you guys. Great speaking to you. Okay.